Humboldt County. Sitka spruce really, in this part of the, you know, in California and Oregon, it needs, it really needs to be on the coast. There's very, you know, in California, the furthest inland it goes is maybe a mile. So, it, you know, it, re, it needs that cold, wet coastal zone with lots of fog in the summer because it cannot tolerate any sort of, of dryness or, or hotness. So, you know, the north coast in the summer is about 50 degrees and foggy. So with that, you get these, these northern California, you know, this coastal strip gets these Pacific Northwest fungi. Um, and this one's actually really restricted in range. It occurs from northern Humboldt County up to about central Oregon and in that coastal spruce zone, and that's it. So it's hidden on cyanopodium. It's like the, the strawberries and cream, but it's blue, so you're going to have blueberries and cream with <laughs> strawberry droplets. It bleeds red when young. It's a really a striking fungus. And then failed Calivia is this, uh, this group that probably originated in the Northwest and kind of spread out from there. It's very diverse in the Northwest with 44 species out of total about 70 species worldwide. So in Washington, Oregon, and California, it has you know about 60% of the world species within this genus. So they're, as a group, they're, none of them are edible. Um, they have these rooting stalks, and some of them, you know, go down over a foot down. Um, and they're mostly drab colors, but there's a couple green ones. Uh, with, this one has the green with lilac gills. Um, and, you know, lots of, lots of orange and browns. But a, a really important fungus. And also, most of the species are restricted to old growth. So a lot of them are rare now because there's not very much old growth left. So you have these, you know, it's, it's one of the species used in the Pacific Northwest forest plan, you know, forest management plan of uh, recognizing old growth forests. So even if, you know, you can, if you, if you find a lot of these species, you know that it's mature forest or old growth forest. Another one that's restricted to old growth is this. This is the only California record of this fungus. Uh, it's one of about 20 fruit bodies known, Brigiophorus nobilissimus, or the novo polypore. This thing here is 54 inches across. Wow. Okay, so this only grows on old growth fir trees that are above a meter across, so you know, more than 40 inches across um, at breast height. So it's a very restricted growth. And um, like I said, it's, it's the only California known example of it from California. There's about, I think there's about 12 different fruit bodies known to be fruiting right now. So very restricted. And so it's, it's also the only species that's recognized <coughs> as an endangered species in North America for fungi. So it's the only, it's the only mushroom or fungus that receives any special protection. Another thing we get a lot of on the North Coast is Cortinarius. Um, so this is, Cortinarius is the largest genus of all fungi with about, probably about 350 to 400 species in California. Uh, probably about 300 of them are brown. So it's <laughs> really difficult, you eat one of them. Uh, so just a few examples. Um, Cortinarius bandusarensis is the one that's covered with slime. It even has a slime veil to it. So you can see the clear veil. And it's breaking away here. Cortinarius acutus is about a centimeter across, so you know, a little bit less than a half an inch across with these really acute umbos. Cortinarius neosanguineus and um, smithii are these few ones that are used for dyes, so you get you know, bright reds and oranges from, you know, natural fibers, like protein fibers like wool or silk from these mushrooms. And there's a bunch of different purple ones. Uh, we have Cortinarius violaceus on the table and Alba violaceus. Um, so this, this is one that you can eat, but I've heard it tastes like mud. I've never tried it. Kind of like this muddy, earthy flavor. It has a really nice odor, like the cedar odor to it. Uh, we'll move down into the live oak zone. So like I said, the live oaks start in about Mendocino County. You still get a lot of Quartinarius with them. Those are still there. Every single 
forest type, you're going to find quaternarias, uh, except for except for redwoods and cedar, which are non mycorrhizal. So this one is a neat one that grows in their oaks. It's here as well. It grows with the black oaks and the <coughs> interior live oaks around here. It has these veil bands of slime all up and down the stem. Quaternaries were really best since it's this beautiful, like straw green colored wine. It can be like neon green sometimes. Uh, we get a lot of amanitas under oak. Amanitas are not all that diverse in California, but an oak is the primary species they grow with. Of course, the death cap, Amanita phylloides, is introduced to California, grows without oak, destroying angels and native deadly poisonous species. Um, but this is one of the edible species. It's not a beginner's mushroom. Um, but a lot of people love this mushroom. In Santa Cruz, it's generally considered like the best edible, where it's, you know, it's really common there. But if you, if you make a mistake with identification of an amanita, you won't live to tell about it. <laughs> if you make a mistake eating a bully, yeah, you'll live. You'll be embarrassed to tell people about it, but at least you'll live to do it. <laughs> so this one's deadly poisonous. Um, Amanita ocreata is a death angel. Similar, but slightly different. But another really common oak one. And then Amanita phylloides was introduced to California in the 1950s with cork oak, and has since spread pretty much all over the place. Anywhere you get live oak, you'll have this species. Occasionally, you grow can oak or black oak. Um, but you can, you can tell this one by the, like that, you know, yellowish green, olive tinge, um, to almost white with a, with an olive tinge or yellowish tinge to it. To the cap, um, the skirt, which will become quite like, you know, be flaring when young, but can be disappear completely in age. And this big white cup, like, you know, universal veil tissue that kind of grows out of the bulb, so it doesn't cup the whole sock base like this one does. You know, this one here is just this big sock-like cup at the bottom. Um, this one here kind of like is an extended tissue from the bulb. So this whole group are they're all deadly poisonous. They you know they contain amatoxins which destroy your liver pretty quickly. They all have a bulbous base. Yeah, they do, but imagine what will happen if you, you, know, you go out and pick it and you break the bulb off. Yeah. A lot of people do that. Um, you know, the Amity of Smith and Union, the one on the table here, that big white one, um, half the stuff that was collected yesterday, over half, didn't have the bottom of the stock. So it's just broken off, and, and that, that can lead to confusion. This is a white form of phylloides. So it can, a lot of Amanitas have the ability to have these pigmentless forms, just to make things even more confusing. Amanita calyptoderma <coughs> the cochra is a common early season fruit, or there was a couple which came in yesterday, uh, but this is in um, this group. The Caesar's amanitas are in this group, and they're really commonly eaten, but once again, um, if you mistake this for a death cap, you're done for. If you're comfortable with your identification, uh, or you bring it to somebody who really knows mushrooms, until you're comfortable with it, then try it. If not, stay away from them. Um, the Amanita muscaria, really common throughout California. On the coast, it's mostly with pine or spruce in the mountains. Usually you get it higher up in the lodgepole pine, two needle pines, but it's around here as well. And this is all the Amanitas that occur in California, are known so far. There's a few more in the Vaginata group, which all look like little gray things. Um, this group right here, here. Uh, so there's a few more species in that group which need to be described, but that's that's it. If I was showing you a slide of, of Amanitas in Massachusetts, um, there would be about four times as many of this in a state that's you know the size of one of your counties. So uh, the main reason for that is you do not have a lot of hardwood forests in California. You don't have a lot of hardwood diversity, and most Amanitas are hardwood associated species. So bolides, this is a really easy group for beginners uh, because there's no deadly poisonous ones, and the poisonous ones are really distinctive. So bolides the sweaty eye or the Satan's bolide, it used to be called bolides satanas, is this common oak species. Stature alone can ID this mushroom. Really thick bulbous stalk that you know comes up to a really narrow apex top of the stalk 
and then this big bun shaped cap on top of that. So if you stay away from all bullets that stain blue and have red pores in California, you're going to be fine. Because everything else is either just bitter tasting or edible. So there's a few bitter bullets in California, um, and then most of the, most of the rest of them are are you know just edible. And some are excellent, some are so so. You know there's some foul tasting bullets, but they're not going to poison you. So Belize amygdalinus is another one of these red, poor, blue staining ones, but it's not poisonous. <laughs> Don't believe books saying that this is poisonous, but stay away from it unless you know Belize. Oreo boletus, um, these things are common live oak species, which don't occur up here, but as soon as you get down to about Auburn, you know, you go down the hill a little bit, um, you know, that, that 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 foot zone around the valley, you'll find a lot of them. Um, or out in the coast under live oak. And this one you can easily re recognize by the bright yellow, I mean, really bright yellow pores on it and sticky cap. It's one of the few bull leads with sticky caps that aren't, you know, slippery jacks or soilis. This is probably your most common king bull lead up here. Uh, so king bull leads are porcinis. This one's commonly called the queen bull lead. It's a dark half form. Um, so it has, you know, really dark brown, well dark to pale, sometimes it's like buried under the duff. It doesn't dark until it gets exposed. There's a couple examples of out on the table. The white reticulation and creamy pores when young becoming yellow, yellowish olive as they age. Unmistakable to a group, you know, these porcini, they're really easy to recognize and very good edibles. And quite common around here. You know, just go look on their ochre madrone. This is a king bully, or you know, the often called porcini. This whole group is referred to as porcini. Uh, one of the best kept secrets in California is that this mushroom is very common under valley oak. So if you go into Central Valley after the fall rains, look for this mushroom. It's there, and none of the coast hunters know about it. <laughs> <laughs> they all look, you know, they all think it's restricted to that pine zone on the, on the north coast. Well, it's not true. Is that early fall or? Yeah, the, but most of the bullies fruit about two weeks after the first soaking rain. Uh, when I drove, I drove up from Santa Cruz and stopped at a couple spots and found it in the Central Valley. So it's still going, but it's on the, the tail end of the season. So believe the edulis variety grand edulis uh, is there's you know reddish brown to oranges brown caps, creamy pores, and then they become more like reddish blush as they age. You can see this like that copper blush with the pale when young. And they almost always have that club shaped stalk, you know, the, the baseball bat. Um, there's, a, there's one in the north coast under spruce which is similar but much paler color. And then in the mountains go higher elevation like August, September, um, you know, fall, look for summer thunderstorms on the peaks, go up to the lodgepole pine forest in the Sierra, you get a lot of it in late summer. But you have to go where the rains have been. Of this or the spring king? The spring king's a different one. I'll have that later on in the talk. Um, the California golden chanterelle isn't up this high, but if you go, once again, if you go down to the live oak zone in the valley foothills, it's there. So it's a bright golden, you know, chanterelle under oaks. Um, these are, you get, in this area, you mostly get the white chanterelle under Douglas fir and madrone, and the, the Cascade chanterelle, the mountain chanterelle, usually under Douglas fir or true firs. So chanterelles are really easy to recognize to a group by having, you can see it's kind of, kind of these blunt gill-like structures on the other side, but it's not a true individual blade like gills, but it's these ridges of lots of these interwoven veins. Um, you can see, you know, see all of these veins like interwoven within there. And then when you break them apart, the flesh on them is like white breast meat of chicken or string cheese, really stringy, pulls apart really easily. Yeah? Do these grow along the coast? They're really common along the coast, and then the, in the mountains you get these two species, okay. generally a little bit earlier in the season, so they're mostly gone by by now. Okay. Um, there's a few out on the table, but they're pretty sad looking. So generally, you know, about three weeks to a month ago is probably when they were peaking. You know, they, you know, so soon after the first rains, they can start before the rains and just sit there and wait for the rains. So they have, you know, they get enough moisture from the trees to start fruiting before the rain, and they really start expanding after the rain. 
but as a group, really easy to recognize. Differentiating some of these species may be a little bit difficult, but when you have them all next to each other, it's easy. But as on all, you don't have to learn different names. You can just call them all chanterelles and eat them all. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, chanterelles are edible. Aren't there some lookalikes, though, that are kind of dangerous? Dangerous? No. This is probably the only dangerous lookalike. So uh, the jack o' lantern and this one, uh, the West Coast, I mean, there's you would have to be really bad at mushroom identification to <laughs> mistake this for a chanterelle. East Coast, uh, people do mistake jack o' lanterns for chanterelles because the East Coast jack o' lantern is bright orange and the East Coast chanterelles are bright orange. So about out here, if it's growing in clusters on wood with kind of this olivaceous tone, you can see really individual gills. In these, in, individual blade-like gills, that's not a chanterelle. So moving on to the tan oak madrone, like I said earlier, you have this forest around here. Consider yourself lucky because within that, it's one of the best edible mushrooms there is. And this is far better than truffles. Truffles are so overrated, uh, which is uncommon. Um, the black trumpet, though, are, you know, sometimes a black chanterelle. They look like these dried up, trumpet-shaped leaves out in the forest. It can be difficult to find if you don't know how to look for them. And you pretty much you just have to look for holes in the ground. Uh, the, they start about now. They're a late season mushroom. So they're just starting to come up now. Uh, they've been fruiting on the coast for about three weeks now. But here, they haven't, you know, start looking at Bullard's Bar next week or so. They should be, you know, up under the tan oak shortly. You also have a lot of Matsutake. So this one is just finishing up. I still, I, you know, yesterday I found about 20 buttons out there like this, and that's what most people are after. But there's a lot of big ones out right now. Once again, you know, it's up at, I went up to Bullard's Bar on Friday and, and yesterday, and there's a lot of them out, so go look for them. This one you can recognize by the really rubbery texture, so it's really firm. You know, if you drop a button, it's going to bounce. If they look like the Amanitas, if you drop them, they're going to shatter. They have this thick membranous veil, this partial veil when young, kind of like breaks off and then sort of dissolves into this gelatinous matter on the stipe and pretty much disappears, but I'll have this annular zone, so a white spot above and a dingier orange staining spot below. Uh, really crowded gills and kind of, you know, that whitish cap that'll be a little bit slimy, tacky when fresh. Um, develop a little bit of orange staining as it ages. And the smell is strong. And the smell. So the smell of this mushroom uh, is this mix of this really sweet spicy odor and this really musty odor. So if you get really like unpleasant musty odor, dirty socks, outhouse odor, don't eat it because you're not going to like it. But if you get this sweet spicy cinnamon odor from it, um, give it a try. And most of the time use it like in um, clear broth soups. It's, it's water soluble, the flavor. So unlike a lot of mushrooms, which you know, like morels or something, you cook up in a cream sauce, uh, you know, a dairy base, a white sauce, or you know, something that um, something that you know, would enhance the whole flavor of the dish that way. With this mushroom, it's a water-based flavor that works much better in, in water-based uh, soups or sauces, or you know, flavoring rice or something like that. So there's a lot of that mushroom out there. <coughs> There's also a lot of this out right now. This is having a really good season up here, the candy caps. So this is one that when you dry it, it develops this odor of maple sugar. And you can use this mushroom in desserts, candy cap cookies, ice cream, just this amazing maple sugar odor that you would not expect from a mushroom. Can you use it as a sweetener, almost? It, do it doesn't have sweetness itself. So it just has the flavor, it doesn't have a sweetness to it. So it's, it's the same compounds that are used in artificial maple, you know, maple wow. syrup. So it's the same chemical compounds. But there's no sweetness. It, you know, uh, it's yeah. just the flavor part. It's not the sweetness part. <laughs> they do have a lot of lookalikes. Um, but the trick is to find this mushroom that matches all these features. So first of all, the cap is dry and granular. It's like running your finger across an orange peel. You know, kind of a little bit bumpy, smooth, but bumpy. You know, it has little pips and stuff in it. It has watery white latex. So you can see where it's been broken, it bleeds that watery white latex. It has a hollow stalk that's really fragile or really easy to break. 
probably took me about 20 before I got a clean section. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of whitish hairs at the base. And then it, when fresh, it has like this fenugreek-like odor. So it's not the maple sugar odor when fresh. It's kind of like a sweet, spicy odor, but not the maple sugar odor. That doesn't occur until after it's dried. So if you look at all of these, some of these have some of those features, but not all of those features. So the closest look like probably is this one, like here, it's rutulous and southern candy cap. It's similar, but just not, doesn't compete with the flavor. This one right here. So this one's common under live oak, but more like brick red colored, orange red colors, stockier, orange hairs, the stipe base, and solid stock, not hollow. That's not it's they're harmless. So all of these lookalikes are not gonna hurt you except for possibly this one. But this one has really thick white latex when you break it, and a very peppery taste. The only one that you really have to worry about is the yellow latex. Milky. So if you break it, it's white latex that goes yellow. Don't eat that one. It's larger and more pink colored. So this one is restricted to madrone trees. There's a few mushrooms which only grow on madrone. This tuberia, which is a group of boring brown mushrooms. This is one exception to that. Is that known as a shrimp mushroom? No. 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 And this thing grows in the bark of madrone. It's a, less than a centimeter across. So this tiny little thing that just coats the bark of madrone trees. But drone is a really good tree for edible wise white chanterelles. Uh, love growing under my drone. Uh, some of the russell, some, like shrimp russell, will grow under my drone. Uh, I know a lot of your bullets, your butter bullets and your, your queen bullets love my drone in this area. So Merasmus corcophilus only grows in oak leaves. So you get these really restricted habitats. This strobilaris only grows on spruce cones. So if there's something out in the woods, there's a mushroom to rot it. <laughs> um, this Merasmus and, and the bluet, so the bluet I'll talk about in a second, these two mushrooms don't care where they grow. They grow on every single organic matter out there, you know, from redwood forest, cypress, which not very many mushrooms grow in, to hardwood litter, like, you know, the bluet is under oak or in grass. Uh, these mushrooms are not picky. So the bluet is another one of your really good and easy to identify edibles. It has that grayish violet cap, the, the you know violet gills, really smooth cap, no scales, no fibers on it. That little, you see the little, this is called prunulus, these little dots on the stalk, kind of like a little scruffy look. And then this binding mycelium that'll bind the organic matter to the site base. Very easy mushroom to recognize, very common later in the year. Uh, and really good edible if you use in like mostly cream-based sauces or tomato sauces. If you cook it up by itself, it's kind of not very good. But, you know, the first few times I tried this mushroom by itself, which is usually what I do, is just cook it up alone. Uh, I was not impressed, and one time I just threw it into a sauce I had, and was like, wow, you can do things with this mushroom. Um, but yeah, the flavor by itself doesn't stand out, but it does, it does really well in, in more complex dishes. The lookalikes this are cortin areas, which have these rusty orange round spores. If you remember that slide, those bluish purple cortin areas. Those are the lookalikes. The spore print, which on this is white to pinkish buff. Um, so kind of like, you know, the pale pinkish. Pinkish in mycology terms is used, it usually refers to buff color. Uh, so kind of like these pale, dingy brown, pinkish brown colors. Um, Cortinarias are always rusty orange. Cortinarias have a veil, so this cortina-like veil, this little spider web partial veil usually. Uh, it can be, you know, like you saw in that last, the Van Dusen Ramps is really slimy. These don't have any sort of veil tissue to them. And then cortinarias have little scales or fibers, sometimes they're pressed into the cap. When these things, like that's being nuda, nude means bare, completely barren of any scales or fibers, just really smooth cap. Alright, so this is definitely a non-native habitat, one that's very common.